If they score, there's a game seven. If they don't, for the second straight year, they go out in six. Stopped it. Harper's on it. Behind the screen. Harper got a piece of it. NBA history is littered with the bones of great teams that just weren't great enough. Iconic, memorable squads that could never get over the hump. Perhaps no team fits that bill as famously as the John Stockton and Carl Malone-led Utah Jazz teams of the 1980s and 90s. They had one of the greatest point guards, power forwards, head coaches, and home court advantages in basketball history. They made the playoffs 18 times in 18 seasons together, won 16 postseason series, made two NBA Finals, and won zero championships. This is the story behind the Stockton and Malone Jazz. After five seasons in New Orleans, the Jazz moved to Utah in 1979. The team kept the same name and Mardi Gras color scheme despite no longer being in the Big Easy, at least in part because there wasn't enough time for a name change after the move was approved. It's hard to overstate how much of a laughingstock those early Utah teams were. The Jazz averaged less than 27 wins per year through the franchise's first four seasons in Salt Lake City, which understandably meant lousy attendance and revenue. Talk of another relocation dominated the airwaves, and the team even played some home games in Las Vegas during those fretful few years to juice their revenues. Making matters worse, after selecting Dominique Wilkins third overall at the 1982 NBA Draft, the Jazz traded the human highlight reel, who wanted no part of Utah, in what would become one of the worst deals in league history. The only reason more wasn't made of that draft day blunder over the years was because the Jazz actually started to turn things around. With general manager Frank Layden proving he also had coaching chops, Adrian Dantley filling the basket, and Mark Eaton manning the middle, the Jazz became a 45-win second-round playoff team in 1983-84, then drafted a point guard named John Stockton 16th overall from the legendary 84 class. Stockton came off the bench for a 500 team that once again lost in the second round in 84-85, and the Jazz proceeded to select Louisiana Tech power forward Carl Malone 13th overall in the subsequent draft. Though the selection of Stockton was an unpopular one in Salt Lake City, and Malone was joining what was at best a mediocre franchise, unbeknownst to Jazz fans and the rest of the association, Utah now had its two pillars of the next two decades. Malone took to the NBA much quicker than Stockton did, becoming a starter as a rookie and a 20 and 10 guy as a sophomore. But the Jazz truly began to take off when Stockton was handed the reins in 1987. Dantley had been traded the year prior, and aging point guard Ricky Green was proving ineffective as the 1987-88 season tipped off. After starting just 45 of his first 249 games for the Jazz, Stockton got the start in the fourth game of the 87-88 campaign. He wouldn't relinquish his duties as Utah's starting point guard until he retired in 2003. After averaging roughly 7 points and 7 assists on middling efficiency through his first three seasons, Stockton exploded to average 14.7 points, 13.8 assists, and 3 steals on 64.5% true shooting in his first year as a starter, leading the league in assists for the first of 9 straight seasons. And he wasn't even the best player on his own team, as a 24-year-old Malone earned his first of 14 All-Star appearances for averaging roughly 28 points and 12 rebounds for a 47-win Jazz team. Though the Jazz had won a couple playoff series over the previous five years, the 1988 postseason felt like a breakthrough, as Utah notched its first series victory with Stockton and Malone playing together, then pushed the eventual champion Lakers to a Game 7 in the Western Conference semifinals. It looked as though the Jazz were on the fast track to title contention. Utah was even better in 88-89 finishing with a then-franchise record 51 wins, despite getting a new head coach less than a quarter of the way into the campaign. 
Layden, citing exhaustion, gave up his sideline responsibilities 17 games into the season as he transitioned into team president and promoted assistant coach Jerry Sloan to the top job on the bench. Sometimes in the NBA, you feel like a dog, Layden said at the time. You age seven years in one. The pressure is intense. It's time to have my time. The Jazz and their new head coach thought it was their time. Utah went 40 and 25 under Sloan, and their two emergent stars looked plenty comfortable playing under him. Malone averaged 29 and 11. Stockton made his second straight All-Star team, and for the second of 11 times, both made an All-NBA team in the same year. Eaton even joined them in the All-Star game and won his second Defensive Player of the Year award. Just as they would get used to all of the regular season accolades, however, Stockton, Malone, and all of Utah would soon get used to bitter postseason disappointments. The first real playoff choke job of the Stockton Malone Sloan era came in 89, when the second seeded Jazz were swept in the first round by seventh seeded Golden State, despite Stockton and Malone posting gaudy numbers. History repeated itself the following season. Stockton enjoyed a career year in 1989-90, averaging 17 points and 14.5 assists, though he also missed time, a whopping four games for the first time in his career. Meanwhile, Malone continued to stuff the stat sheet. Sloan kept the Jazz executing like clockwork, and 55 wins later, Utah entered the playoffs as the number four seed. They then lost to Phoenix in the first round, this time in five games, on a Kevin Johnson jumper that came with less than one second remaining in the series. Five three-point shooters in the ballgame for the Suns. McGee back to Kevin Johnson, and he scores! And there are eight-tenths of a second remaining. Phoenix on the Kevin Johnson basket, lead it by two. Though the team's two superstars still produced on the whole, both Stockton and Malone saw their efficiency dip in the series, with Stockton shooting 3 of 11 in the winner-take-all Game 5. As happens so often in the what-have-you-done-for-me-lately world of pro sports, Stockton, Malone, and the Jazz went from the NBA's young darlings to being labeled postseason chokers. Though the ultimate prize remained elusive, the Jazz did work hard to shed that label as the 90s wore on. The fifth-seeded Jazz returned the favor against fourth-seeded Phoenix in the first round of the 91 playoffs, beating the Suns three games to one before being eliminated by Clyde Drexler's Blazers in the second round. Despite needing a full five games to beat the seventh-seeded Clippers in the first round in 92, a 55-win second-seeded Jazz team finally made the franchise's first Western Conference Final that year, where they again fell short against Portland. The Jazz also moved from Tiny Salt Palace to the Delta Center that season then hosted the All-Star Game the following year in 1993, where Stockton and Malone shared All-Star MVP honors. Other than a 47-win blip of a season in 92-93 that saw the Jazz lose in the first round to a rising Sonics team, Utah made deep playoff runs throughout the 90s. As far as the Western Conference went back then, it was death, taxes, and the Jazz playing deep into at least May, as Stockton and Malone pick and rolled teams to death and they did it with a continually evolving supporting cast. Jeff Malone came over from Washington in the early 90s to provide some much needed secondary scoring and was then moved to Philly for Jeff Hornacek a few years later. Longtime jazz forward Thurl Bailey was dealt to Minnesota for the defensive-minded Tyrone Corbin. Defensive swingman and eventual Michael Jordan nemesis Byron Russell was drafted in 93. Felton Spencer was eventually brought in to replace an aging Eaton as the team's starting center, though an Achilles injury during the 94-95 season led to the end of Spencer's tenure in Salt Lake City. Fun fact, when the Jazz eventually traded Spencer to Orlando in the summer of 96, they acquired the draft pick that would turn into Andre Kirilenko three years later. Anyway, Greg Ostertag, drafted in 1995, eventually replaced Spencer as the team's starting center, only to eventually be replaced himself by Greg Foster. Finally, reserve guard Shandon Anderson was drafted in 96 to solidify Sloan's rotation. No matter who came and went though, the story largely remained the same. The 53-win Jazz lost to the eventual champion Rockets in the 1994 West Final. The 60-win Jazz learned to never underestimate the heart of a champion when they lost in the first round of the 1995 playoffs to the eventual champion Rockets, which included a much debated decision in the final seconds of the winner-take-all Game 5. 
assists. Not John Stockton-like numbers today. He hits the first. They got they, they still got to try to make the basket. There's 3.5. There's plenty of time. You can still get another miss. You can even make a steal on the inbound play. We'll see how they play it, but I think Stockton's looking for a mate. No. No, he did. with the ball and draws the foul, and we'll go to the other end with two seconds to play. In 1996, the 55-win Jazz lost in the conference finals once again, rallying back from 3-1 down against the Sean Kemp and Gary Payton-led Sonics before losing a Game 7 heartbreaker in Seattle. The breakthrough was coming though, sort of. The 1996-97 season was a magical one in Salt Lake City. Sporting new and soon to be iconic jerseys that paid tribute to Utah's mountain ranges, the Jazz led the conference with 64 wins, which still stands as a franchise record. Malone took home his first of two MVP awards. The Jazz ripped off two separate 15-game win streaks and finished the season with a point differential that still ranks top 25 all time. Utah finished seven games clear of second place Seattle in the West standings, then went 11-3 through the first three rounds of the playoffs, culminating in the biggest shot in franchise history. Nearly a decade and a half of postseason demons were exercised when Stockton's Game 6 buzzer beater eliminated Houston in the 97 West Finals, propelling the Jazz to their first NBA Finals appearance. Unfortunately for the Jazz, the team waiting for them in the Finals, the defending champion Chicago Bulls, just so happened to be one of the few teams in history that could actually beat them. A year after their record-setting 72-win championship season, the Bulls returned to the 1997 Finals as a 69-win juggernaut with the fifth best point differential ever. The Jazz seemed up for the challenge and had the ball with time ticking away in an even game one before disaster struck, giving us a glimpse of the heartbreak ahead for Utah over the next two Junes. Malone, whose mailman nickname was born of the idea that he always delivered on the court, went to the foul line for two shots with nine seconds left in a tied game one. That's when Scottie Pippen famously whispered something to him. The MVP, who was a 75.5% free throw shooter that season and had already made three of four that night, missed both, setting the stage for a Michael Jordan game winner only moments later. When Pippen revealed what he had said to Malone only moments earlier at the free throw line, it would stain the Hall of Fame big man's legacy forever. You said something to Carl Malone just before he shot those free throws. You guys are close friends. What did you say to him to throw him off? I said a mailman doesn't deliver on a Sunday. Still, Malone and the Jazz showed their resiliency in rallying back from a 2-0 series deficit with wins at home in games 3 and 4, giving Utah another golden opportunity in game 5. The finals was still contested in a 2-3-2 format at the time, meaning the Jazz, who were 48-3 at home, including 10-0 in the playoffs up to that point, were primed to push the Bulls to the brink of elimination before the series shifted back to Chicago. In addition, Jordan showed up to Game 5 in horrendous shape, whether from the flu, a good old-fashioned hangover, or food poisoning from tainted pizza. The Jazz even coasted to a 13-point advantage through one quarter, but we know how the rest went. Between Malone's Game 1 free throws and an 8-point lead with 10-19 left in the flu game, the Jazz probably felt like they should have won the series in 5 games. 
Instead, they were headed back to Chicago facing elimination in game six, where the Bulls would end the series after rallying back from a nine point deficit early in the fourth quarter. A frantic game six ending also included a rookie Anderson missing a reverse layup with 30 seconds left in a tie game, which Utah hoop heads maintain until this day was a result of Pippen pulling on the rim. The Jazz returned largely intact the following year, confident they had the goods to vanquish the Bulls. In fact, the 11 players who played the most for Utah in 96-97 all returned for the 97-98 campaign under the continued tutelage of Sloan, who somehow never won a Coach of the Year award. Behind Malone's dominance and Jeff Hornacek's shooting, the Jazz managed a respectable 11-7 start to the year despite the fact Stockton was sidelined by a knee injury. When their star point guard returned to the lineup, Utah finished the season on a 51-13 tear to match Chicago with a league-leading 62 wins. The Jazz again strolled through the west side of the playoffs with an 11-3 record, culminating in a conference final sweep of an early Shaq and Kobe Lakers squad. Utah entered the finals with home court advantage this time, thanks to a 2-0 season series sweep of the Bulls and a massive rest advantage. Sweeping the Lakers gave the Jazz 10 days off before Game 1, while the Bulls were forced to go the distance in a 7-game East Finals against the Pacers. It's easy to forget, more than two decades later, that the Jazz were favorites in this Finals rematch. That was reinforced when a Game 1 overtime victory gave Utah its 7th straight win, dating back to its second round series against San Antonio. You want an opportunity to play the team that beat you last year and won the title, Malone said at the time, and in this business, sometimes you get your wish. He should have been careful what he wished for, as that game one win would be the peak of Utah's two decade climb up the NBA hierarchy. Malone's finals resume continued to take a beating as the series progressed. He shot five of 16 in game two as the Jazz blew another fourth quarter lead. Then came the embarrassment of game three, when the Bulls spanked the Jazz by 42 points. Utah's 54 points for the game was the lowest scoring performance by a team in any game in the shot clock era up to that point. In the span of four nights between games one and three, the Jazz had gone from finally being able to see the mountaintop to being caught in an avalanche. After dropping game four, Utah fought off elimination in game five to send the series back home needing to win both games but one last fourth quarter heartbreak awaited Jazz fans in game six. Malone is doubled, they swat at it and steal it. Here comes Chicago, 17 seconds. 17 seconds from game seven or from championship number six. Jordan, open, Chicago with the lead. Stopped it. Harper's on it, behind the screen. Harper got a piece of it, it comes off. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship, and it's their second three-peat. As much as the balletic synchronization of Stockton and Malone's two-man game left an undoubtable legacy of excellence, it's paired with memories of Malone's missed free throws, Anderson's missed layup, and Russell's cries of a push-off on Jordan's last jumper. The Jazz always managed to shoot themselves in one foot while Jordan swept the other leg. The franchise's back-to-back -back finals losses against one of sports' most mythical figures and starriest teams cemented the Jazz as the ultimate heels, merely existing so that the main characters and heroes have someone to beat. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Though the players around Stockton and Malone turned over and faded away like Sandlot characters, the two stars, along with Sloan, continued to toil away for years, only to come up short time and time again. Malone won a second MVP award in the lockout shortened 1999 campaign, and the Jazz finished tied with the eventual champion Spurs atop the overall standings, but lost to Portland in the second round of the playoffs. The Blazers, who had a strong core of Rasheed Wallace, Arvidas Sabonis, Damon Stoudemire, and Steve Smith, acquired Pippen ahead of the 99-2000 season then beat a 55-win Jazz team in the West Semis again that spring. And that was effectively the end of the road for Utah's two franchise cornerstones. By the time the Jazz advanced past the first round again seven years later, Malone and Stockton were long gone. 
Stockton retired in 2003, and later that year, a 40-year-old Malone played his final season in Los Angeles, where, cruelly enough, the big man's career ended with his heavily favored Lakers losing a lopsided finals against Detroit. The Jazz have fielded plenty of competitive teams since, but advanced to the conference finals just once in the first 19 years following the Stockton and Malone era. That era provided so many memories for Utah, but those Jazz squads are also the poster boys for good teams that were never quite good enough, for dynasties that had everything but the rings. Ultimately, it makes for a legacy that's difficult to reconcile. On one hand, the Jazz did make the finals in the only two seasons Utah finished with the number one seed, but in 18 seasons together, Stockton and Malone also lost eight different playoff series as the higher seeded team. The star duo combined for 24 All-Star appearances, 25 All-NBA selections, and 9 All-Defensive team nods, while combining to miss a grand total of only 32 games in those 18 years together. Only the Lakers won more regular season games during Stockton and Malone's time as teammates, and only the Lakers and Bulls won more playoff games during that time. But Chicago and LA combined to win 11 of those 18 championships, while the Jazz were shut out when it mattered most. So, sustained excellence or sustained failure? Models of consistency or consistent choke artists? Only one team can win every year, but how is it possible that not one of those Jazz teams emerged as the last team standing even once? In the end, the Jazz teams of Stockton and Malone serve as the ultimate test case for one of sports' ultimate questions. Would players, fans, and organizations as a whole trade sustained success, nearly two decades of memories, for just one precious championship ring? Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button.